Hey, <laughs> hi. <laughs> Welcome everyone to this month's Teach the Web talk. Um, to, joining us today is Jane Park from Creative Commons. Um, just a little Hello, bit, <laughs> hey. Just a little bit about um, the call before we start. So this call is live on Google Hangouts. And so if you have any questions, please drop them into the chat on the event page. We are taking questions on Twitter as usual, so please tweet your questions for Jane using the hashtag TeachTheWeb. We're also running a discourse page where post call we will keep the conversation going about today's topic and we will upload any links that Jane discusses today during the talk. Um, as you know, we turn these talks into podcasts and the link for these podcasts is on the discourse page um, and you can subscribe here for all upcoming posts. Um, your hosts today are myself, Sarah Allen. Um, I work for the Mozilla Learning Network, and so I'm based in London. Hi, my name is Lucy. Uh, I'm based in Toronto, and I work for Mozilla. Hi, my name is Simona. I'm also based in Toronto, and I represent Mozilla and the Hive Learning Networks. And our speaker today is Jane Parks from Creative Commons. Yes. Hello, everyone. I'm usually based in Los Angeles, but today I am in San Francisco. Welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. No problem. We're very jealous of your weather. <laughs> <laughs> so today's topic is working in the open web. And so as Mozillians, it's in our methodology to work in the open. We all know that skill sharing and working collaboratively is mutually beneficial. But when you share your creativity, you're enabling people anywhere to use it and learn from it. We share work that others can use and build upon. But what are the copyright laws and the rights? What do all rights reserved mean? And what do the double C's mean at the end of a blog post? So when I started my research today for today's call with Jane, um, I thought that Creative Commons licensing just belonged on photography and slides like Flickr. However, as I learned more about the company and the array of projects they were involved in, the resources and offer and the scope of open licenses available, I did realize that the scale and impact of Creative Commons. So today we're going to talk to Jane about harnessing the power of working in the open and understanding and using the skills of open licensing for your projects. So yeah, Jane, thanks so much for joining us on the call. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day. Thanks for inviting me. No problem. So we start the call usually with a couple of icebreaker questions. And they're just kind of a couple of silly questions for us to all get in the groove. Um, so the first icebreaker question that I will throw at Lucy first. Um, so if you could make any song a Creative Commons license so that you could use it as your theme song, what would you choose? Um, so I thought very long and hard about this, and I realized what I wanted was a song that like didn't build up any expectations that I might not be able to then meet. So I wanted something that was like fun and goofy. Um, and though I cannot remember the name of the song, I was kind of landing on uh, that like Saturday Night Fever song that John Travolta walks down the street to. The do 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 do. So that would be my choice. I think people would know it was going to be fun interacting with me, but not like not be too daunted or anything. Uh, possibly in contrast with some. <laughs> <laughs> Mona, what about you? Um, I had some time to think uh, after our previous conversation on this, and I am a huge hip hop fan, and I think I would change my choice to um, Waka Flocka's No Hands. I could listen to that song every day, and it has the greatest beat, and I just want to be associated with something that cool. Nice. Very cool. <laughs> Jane, can, can you hear us? Yeah. Um, so I did not actually think long and hard about this. I just <laughs> thought about this five minutes ago. <laughs> I was told about the question, which I should have looked at before. But um, so I think um, so I recently. <laughs> <laughs> so I recently moved to Los Angeles, maybe two and a half years ago, and I really fell in love with it. So I'd say my theme song is a combination of "This Must Be the Place" by Talking Heads and Staying Alive by the Bee Gees, just because you know every day <laughs> struggle sometimes, but it's always great. I'm, I'm full of joy of life. <laughs> Staying Alive, another Saturday Night Fever song? <laughs> yeah. It, it yeah. kind of feels like it's so, from the Square. Yeah. <laughs> that was a really good answer for having thought about it for two seconds, James. <laughs> <laughs> so I did 
I thought I started thinking about this maybe like this morning and I kind of thought I was like, you know, I love Fleetwood Mac and I love the chain. So like, you know, I was thinking about the the great piece of the chain and like, you know, be really motivational and really bouncy and waking everyone up and but then it's got this really, really long intro. So there'll be a lot of me kind of like walking on stage with a long intro kind of maybe circling around stage. So I need something a little bit choppy. So I'm gonna to default to Eye of the Tiger. Mm. Okay. That's the that's one. Yeah. Just start like playing that. in everyone else's head the second she said that. Like, it's <laughs> the <Tiger." laughs> um, Okay, so since we're, we're talking also about events and when you find yourself out in front of a large group, um, what is your go-to icebreaker when you're trying to wake up the crowd in front of you? Jane, do you want to take this one to start? Sure. Um, actually, I'll use the one that I use for um, workshops I do around kind of uh, School of Open education programs, I'll tell people, think about the one time where an open tool or resource or something free that you found online um, helped you, um, and then I'll just go around the room and they'll, actually what they have, I have them do is take a post-it and draw themselves and write their Twitter handle and then put it on a board that's kind of like a um, post-it version of a class picture from the 90s. Oh, <laughs> so. nice. That's very cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a great one. <laughs> Simona, what about you? Um, one that I've always done, uh, and it works really great with like youth and adult um, populations, is uh, Rock Champion of Hearts. So you get uh, everybody kind of has to go up and introduce themselves to someone that they don't know, and that they have to do rock a rock paper scissors tournament. And at the end of it, if you lose to that person, you become their personal cheerleader. So is people will go around and be collecting, like winning all these tournaments and like collecting all these cheerleaders until you have these two massive groups of people like screaming and yelling at each other. And um, you make it like you really hype it up between the last two contenders and the person who wins, just like the whole group erupts. It's a great way to introduce people to each other and also get people kind of out of their chairs and really um, excited about what you're about to do. Yeah, and get them really pumped. Nice one. Mm -hmm. Lucy? That is so much more <laughs> exciting than mine. Um, I like to ask people kind of questions to get to know them a little bit and uh, have them say something related to what we're going to be talking about. Often, this comes in the form of a spectrogram, uh, which if you don't know what that is, it is tried, tested, and true, especially here at Mozilla. We love spectrograms. And you take a group of people and you ask uh, them to you tell them they're going to line up based on how much they agree or disagree with the statement. So like one side of the room will be like completely disagree, the other side will be completely agree, and then people will line up in the middle and kind of feel like I'm not sure or a little bit agree, a little bit disagree. Then you put out kind of like a controversial statement based around what you're going to be like leaving the conference or leaving the group about. So if it was about Creative Commons, it'd be like you think everyone should have to make the things they produce Creative Commons by law. And so some people be like strongly agree, strongly disagree, and then you pick people at random and ask them to explain their position. You do a couple of those, gets people moving. Uh, it's kind of like a combination between Jane and Simona's. Yeah, like you're getting people up out of their seats and thinking. So it's also kind of intimidating as well, but uh, I think that's the right way to start it. Discord. And um, so I, like I was thinking about the last time I had an event, and I had it for, it was like a load of preteens. And so for me, the icebreaker was I was like, what will I do with these guys? So I was like, volume. So like try to get them excited and jumping on the seat. So I had them like shout out answers to me all at the same time, which kind of got them quite rowdy. <laughs> um, but it 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 worked. Um, and another icebreaker I did before, it was like it was the first time I was in front of a large group for Mozilla. Um, and I had not planned it at all, but it, you know those moments when you're daunted and you're standing in front of a group of people and you're like, what am I going to do? What do I say? So I tried to get everyone to sing, what will, what does the fox say? With mixed yeah. results. Yeah. <laughs> but um, <laughs> so, wasn't the best one, but uh, it, it, did, it broke down some barriers and I think it got people laughing with and at me. So that was great. <laughs> okay. Um, I think we will start and jump into the questions. Um, and so I, today's topic is working in the open web and harnessing the power of open source for your project and event, talking with Jane from Creative Commons. Um, so Jane, 
Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got involved with Creative Commons? Sure. Um, so I've been at Creative Commons. I am probably the longest standing staff member at Creative Commons. <laughs> I don't know if that's impressive or a little sad, <laughs> but I've been there for um, over seven years, yeah. So um, I started in January 2008, um, and I really just, um, when I started, it was a temporary research position in the open education space, um, and I was going to be in and out in six months and move on to, you know, other things. But once I started Creative Commons, as many people do, they kind of get sucked into that world, and they really start um, believing in um, what Creative Commons stands for. And I had worked in education previously. I had worked... Um, I had worked for the Y Scholars at the YMCA um, in Berkeley. I had worked with a group of youth, first-generation college-bound youth, um, to get them into college. Um, and I'd had training in AmeriCorps as well. So I was kind of passionate about the education space, and I believe that um, equity could be achieved through certain kinds of education programs. And so when I joined Creative Commons, I was doing research in open education um, to see whether you know, the open aspect of education could also lead to equity, um, I guess on a more intellectual level. And then I got kind of more hands-on. I moved on to communications for the education program. Um, I moved within the organization to manage different projects. I worked with uh, Mike Linksfair, the vice president at the time. And then um, I started doing communications for the organization as a whole. And then I started um, this project called the School of Open, which is a community of Creative Commons and Mozilla and P2P volunteers around the world uh, running free education programs in their regions on the power of open um, and educational resources in Creative Commons and how that can um, kind of result in equity um, and access to education for people of all different ages, no matter what stage they are at their lives, because the resources are free online. Um, and I'm still here, and now I'm leading Creative Commons' platform initiative, which is all about Creative Commons adoption in major platforms such as Flickr, Vimeo, YouTube, um, and how we can kind of build a community, a social layer around those resources, and how we can get those platforms to work better together so that um, all those resources are more easily available to people. So you've almost yeah. tapped in nearly every seat within Creative Commons. <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. <laughs> pretty soon I'll have exhausted my um. <laughs> yeah. No, it sounds like it's yeah. it's always evolving. So that really speaks quite true to Creative Commons and what you guys set out to achieve. Yeah, I have to say that um, Creative Commons has afforded me opportunities that I probably would never have um, had otherwise, and I've met amazing people um, all around the world through it. And can you tell us? It Oh, go ahead, Lucy. Sorry. I was just going to say, it's so interesting to hear your story about Creative Commons, and I feel like I know a little bit about it because mm -hmm. I see it everywhere, um, but I'd love to hear kind of what the story of Creative Commons is, like how it got started, um, what its mission is, um, just a little bit more about it from someone who's actually in it. Yeah, sure. So I'll tell you my version of events. Um, I wasn't around at the very beginning, but I might as well have <laughs> since I've been around for so long. Um, Creative Commons, the organization, was founded in 2001, and it was founded by um, Lawrence Lessig and a group of other lawyers and kind of legal academics, um, and they came together. This was right after, around the time that I think Larry went to the Supreme Court to um, kind of make the case that copyright law should not be extended, that it should be, the term limits should be limited like it was back in 1976 when copyright was a limited right that you had to reapply for every 14 years and then your copyright expired and entered the public domain. Um, but, you know, since 1976, copyright law has gotten more increasingly restrictive over the years and now your copyright is automatic and it lasts for your entire life plus 70 years after you die um, and it keeps getting extended because every time copyright law is about to expire uh, companies like Disney go and lobby Congress and you know um, the inevitable happens and so Larry lost that Supreme Court case and he thought well I can't change the law right now but what can I do so he got together with a bunch of brilliant legal minds and they started they came up with the idea for Creative Commons, which was essentially kind of a hack to the existing system at the time. It wasn't necessarily a hack because it did build upon copyright law. Without copyright law, Creative Commons couldn't exist. But they thought, well, only two extremes exist right now. You can either reserve all of your rights and your copyright lasts forever, and there's not an easy way to share online when all this digital content exists, or you can give up all your rights and put it in the public domain, but what author would want to do that? 
And so mm -hmm. they decided to found Creative Commons, which was a set of copyright licenses that existed in the middle ground. So it would allow creators to maintain their copyright, but they could um, grant certain reuse permissions to the public. Um, so it really gave creators more options and gave them more flexibility in how they could share their works online. And that's why Creative Commons was founded. Um, and since 2001, it's evolved um, into this set of six really strong copyright licenses that work around the world um, and mm -hmm. can be attached to any kind of media, including video, songs, scientific data, research articles, and whatnot. It's really That's so cool. cool. Yeah. So, what did, so when they started it, what was it focusing on for the, what were the licensing focusing on? What, it was educational research? I think it was both culture and education. It launched with MIT OpenCourseWare as a strong partner. So MIT OpenCourseWare, as you know, is all under Creative Commons. It's under the non-commercial share-alike license. So that was one of the early adopters. I believe Flickr was one of the early adopters as well. So, you know, images. And they had a lot of sort of, um, I think, partners in the film um, and media and music industry as well. Um, I think we talked about Nine Inch Nails. That wasn't that was several years after Creative Commons was founded, but I think it was like two thousand eight or two thousand nine that Trent Reznor released um, two albums under uh, Creative Commons, and I forget the name. It was a slip, and the and Ghosts Ghosts that album was under non commercial share like, and when he released that in two thousand eight, it was actually the best selling Amazon MP three album of the year, even though the music was available for free download. Um, part of the reason was because they were always already really famous, but the other part of the reason was because, you know, he had a lot of fans who wanted to support him, and even though you could download the music for free, there were other things like packaging and, and um, limited edition releases and t-shirts and vinyl that, um, that sold really well. It was a really good promotional tool for them. Great. Thanks so much, Jane. Um, I think a really big question for um, some of our listeners is um, we talk about, and this conversation is going to be about, you know, Creative Commons and that, that ability to create open source um, licenses and, and technologies. But what does uh, open source actually mean? So open source, that term itself, I think, derived, originated in the free software world. So, um, you know, it was all about uh, copyleft licenses with coding. When people developed software, they wanted to ensure that anything that was built on top of free software would also be shared back um, with um, you know, the rest of the world. And so when it's applied to content, copyrightable content like media, um, educational resources, scientific data, it's kind of evolved to just mean, um, especially in the Creative Commons world, when we say open educational resources, we mean things that you can not just access and read for free online, because that's pretty much everything. It doesn't really matter whether copyright law governs that or not, but something that you can actually reuse and repurpose and translate and remix and build upon and then share that derivative work back out um, to the rest of the world so that other people can also um, build upon that. So it's kind of this continually iterative, evolving process where um, people kind of build on top of each other. Um, and that's how scientific progress and social innovation um, happens. It's because people build on what came before. No one, you know, is completely creative in a vacuum. Um, and so that's kind of what open would mean, I think, in the education space, so especially as pertains to Creative Commons licenses. And I think all of our licenses, except for two of them, allow people to create derivative works based upon content. Awesome. Thank you. I really like what you said about that that makes one of the reasons people would choose to make their work open and what are some of the benefits for them because obviously um, I there are definitely benefits yes. to keep uh, so you cut well. a little bit so in and out there, but I think the question was um, what are some of the reasons people would share openly? Mm -hmm. And what are the benefits for them? Am I right? Yeah, I believe <laughs> yeah. that's what I'm saying. Okay. <laughs> for me as well. <laughs> All right. Um, so I think um, people want to 
more than kind of if, if your primary reason is not to make money off of your work but to gain something else from it whether it's notoriety distribution or feedback then making it open um, is really beneficial because then you get that instant feedback um, and you get people um, giving you credit because all Creative Commons licenses have the attribution condition um, and you're also giving people a very clear signal that you want your work to be redistributed and shared whereas if you don't attach a CC license it's not so clear with people and they have to ask you for permission each and every time but CC licenses basically facilitate sharing so whatever you however you want to share your work CC licenses will facilitate that and make it clear for, to people that whenever they see that symbol they'll know that, oh, this person really wants to share their work, they want feedback on their work, they want me to give them credit, um, and they're, my, they're open to collaboration. And so I think that is one of the primary benefits that people use CC licenses as this sort of universal indicator and symbol for sharing. And an indicator that people want to work further on each their project or on their written piece. It's not finished, that they're ready to have outside collaborators to come in and take it to the next step. Exactly, yeah. And do you have some guidelines for people who are working in the open and want to kind of take this step to working collaboratively? Yeah, so we have um, marking guidelines. We have best practices for attribution, how you can give people credit, and I'll put that in the chat here, and, um, and then you can also share it out um, later on. Um, and we also have uh, best practices for mark your own work with a Creative Commons license. Um, and basically, um, our attribution guidelines are, you know, be reasonable, uh, use your common sense, and depending on the medium you're working with, obviously you would attribute in different ways. Um, but one acronym that we use, and this works especially well with kids, so it should work just as equally well with adults, um, is TASL, T-A-S-L, and that just stands for Title, Author, Source, and License which is pretty easy to remember, tassel. <laughs> <laughs> and you just spoke about attribution here. Um, what, what do you mean when you say attribution? Because you mentioned it twice now. Uh -huh. What about attribution? Yeah. What, what does attribution mean? Oh, attribution means giving credit to the, um, the author of the work or the copyright owner. Oh. So we're, we're all used to giving attribution, giving people credit. You know, when we were kids in elementary school, we always had to cite um, wh whoever's author's work we used. Um, so those are norms that um, persist even without the legal backing. And with Creative Commons licenses, there is a legal requirement to give credit to any owner of a work that you are using for free. Credit word you. Yep. Awesome. Um, Jane, you mentioned your background in education and how does this kind of, how does Creative Commons and the you know, open source impact the educational space? I think probably right now more than any other time and more than any other field, education has the biggest potential for um, change because of open licensing and because of um, these new things called open educational resources and that movement associated with it because especially in the U.S. and probably other parts of the world, we're at a place where a lot of um, students are going to four-year colleges, they're coming up with a lot of debt and not necessarily a job lined up. Um, and so and even community colleges, are, costs are rising. And why is that so? And it's because textbooks, things like textbooks are really expensive, access to intellectual property and research is really expensive. But if you think about it, a lot of um, education like math and science, it all that stuff is pretty much, you don't, math is, up to a certain extent, math is not going to change over the years, so why is the same mathematical lesson from the 1920s um, cost so much more now? Those resources could be free, you pay once to develop them, and then they should be free forever, and they can be free forever under CC licenses. And so if you cut down those costs for students, then they can spend that extra money on housing or boarding or... Um, um, furthering their education in other ways. So I think there's huge potential there um, for the education space to be changed because of open licensing, especially on works, on educational resources that have already been paid for. Th those should be open um, to students. Uh, I was wondering, so I know we probably have a lot of educators listening um, who either are already kind of thinking about putting things in the open uh, or they just heard that and were like, absolutely, educational resources should be openly available. 
Uh, what are the steps if they've created curriculum and now they want to share it to make sure that it's a like, Creative common license? What's the practical? How do you do that? Um, so they could do, they could make it open in um, many ways. I mean, the one obvious way is if they have a website, they would throw their book or um, lesson plan up on their website and slap the CC license notice on it. But that doesn't mean that anyone will find it <laughs> because, you know, it's a website. So um, I would suggest going to an education platform um, that has a community of teachers such as, um, uh, let's see, for if you're in higher education or any kind of education connection, cnx.org, and I'll post a link of that here, um, is pretty much an online platform where you can put um, textbooks and other educational lesson plans under Creative Commons attribute. Um, then there are other other platforms which I am blanking on right now, but we have a list of them at our website. Um, we can add those links into the Discord so people want to follow up afterwards. Yeah, yeah. So I'll add a link to um, our education page that lists some of them. Um, but there are a lot of communities out there that already have integrated Creative Commons licensing, so you can just create an account there. It depends on what your area of expertise is and whether you're K-12 or higher education, so um, you can find the right, right platform and community for you and um, you can add the CC license there and then you'll have a, automatically a built-in community to respond to your to your work. It's That's almost awesome. like that, that, is, that is incredible. It's almost like you're creating like you're creating free education, you know, so the your people who are going to universities can almost kind of sustain um, their education through um, documentation and um, publishings that have been processed as Creative Commons licensing. Is there any major universities who have taken on board the Creative Commons licensing that have published like reports um, that online so people can easily access them without having to go to that university? Uh, definitely. Um, most major universities or institutions have, and they're part of the Open Courseware Consortium. So when it's MIT Open Courseware, they put out um, a, a lot of their courses under uh, the Creative Commons non-commercial share like license. Um, so I'm going to paste a link into the Open Courseware Consortium site, yeah. OCWC. Um, and, you know, Yale has also issued their courses online under CC licenses, so as UC Berkeley, so as Tufts University, a lot of U.S. institutions, but also a lot of um, international institutions. In fact, I think there was um, a Brazilian and a Spanish university who translated the MIT Open, course, MIT Open courses because they were freely, you know, available under CC, so they were allowed to do that, and they didn't have to go to MIT before permission to do that. They could just go ahead and do so. Um, so let's see, here is the link to the... Perfect. Do you find, um, so people not only publish reports or um, thesis under the Creative Commons licensing, but what about like recording lectures or even recording high school classes and, and putting that online? Is, is that happening as something? Is that kind of evolving educational resources? Yeah, actually, all the universities I, I mentioned were, um, they're putting out lectures, video lectures, um, and lesson plans around the lectures and syllabi. Um, TED Talks, that's all under CC. Um, yeah. So that's another one. Um, they are, TED Talks are under the most restrictive license, though, so you, they don't allow derivative works based upon um, those talks, but they are under NCND um, regardless. Um, yeah, there's so much media under, especially with video lectures, I think um, you can go to Vimeo, YouTube, um, and other platforms, and they have enabled CC licensing for that kind of stuff. And it's a, I guess that's a good point now to say that, you know, once this talk is over, once we brought, finish the broadcast, this, um, this YouTube video is going to be under a Creative Commons licensing as well. Yes. Yeah. So YouTube has um, enabled one license, the Creative Commons Attribution License, but it's the most open, and I want to say personally the best license, <laughs> one of the best licenses, that and share like I think NCC0, which is a public domain dedication tool. But um, So yeah, this talk will be under CC BY. And so what's share like? Share like is kind of the copy I was left. actually wondering... Uh... Oh, go ahead, Lucy. 
I think my internet's cutting out a little bit, so I'm accidentally talking over people. Um, I just noticed that in your last answer, Jane, you mentioned a different licenses. Um, and I was just wondering if you could tell us what those licenses and what they do mean. I think we kind of have to decipher what you've asked because unfortunately the internet keeps dropping out. But I do think, you know, from looking at Jane's face as well, I think we both got what you said, which is, can you tell us about the different licenses? Is that correct? I think maybe she, Lucy and Simona have dropped off for a bit, but I think okay. maybe we can continue on that and then Lucy, when she comes back, she can dive into it further. But yeah, like what are the different licenses? You mentioned share alike and CC open. Yeah, okay. So there are six different Creative Commons licenses um, um, and they are a combination of four different elements and the four elements are attribution, which I mentioned. You have to give credit to the original author and all of our licenses have the attribution condition as a base element. So on top of that, you can choose to add additional conditions, and there are three additional conditions you can add. One is non-commercial, and that's if you want to prohibit commercial uses of your work, you don't want people selling it, um, you want to reserve your, your commercial rights, you would add the non-commercial condition. Um, the second one is no derivative works, which means that you don't want people creating modifications, significant modifications or translations without your permission, then you would add the no derivative works condition. And then the third um, and last condition that we um, that you also asked about is a share alike condition. And that's known as a copy left condition. And that basically says, um, I'm fine that you, if you translate my work or remix it or create a derivative work, but I want you to share your own derivative work that you made based upon my work under the same exact license. So I want you to essentially share alike um, using the same terms that I use to share my work. So that kind of, the share alike clause kind of um, requires you to also uh, share your work freely, which is why it's called copyleft. It, you know, whatever you produce, it contributes it back to the public pool of knowledge. And so one example of that is Wikipedia. All of Wikipedia is under a Creative Commons attribution share alike license, which ensures that the Wikipedia, the, the the contributions to it just continues to grow and grow and grow because the community builds on it and continues to contribute back to the same pool of knowledge. So, so you, you've kind of gone into the basics of those licenses, but can you, I know you've used Wikipedia as an example, but maybe is there, like for an educator, if I'm a teacher in a classroom and my students have worked on this project um, all year round and we get to the end result and we want to publish our report, but we want to do it under mm -hmm. Creative Commons. So what kind of licensing then does that apply to us? Kind of um, so you'd, you would have to really think about it. Um, it, it depends on each co context. Generally in education, the, the primary goal primary. Um, is not to make money. So the non-commercial condition no. probably wouldn't make probably sense wouldn't in that, sense. that space. Uh, generally uh, speaking, generally for speaking a report for where it's the collective report, report contributed collective report. by many different people, people um, um, you want to probably share it as widely as possible to build up and translate it, um, so, translate I add, it so I would add probably the attribution license or the attribution share like license, license depending, on share depending on whether you want people to share that work back to the rest of the community. Okay, and I guess as, as an educator I could go on the website and see all, like this is quite laid out quite, quite easily for people. Yes, so creative um, yes. So like students want to do some stuff. Can I put the link in the chat? Oh, really? I'm hearing myself mm -hmm. echo, actually. I'm hearing myself echo, actually. I think we're going to mute if we're not talking, um, so then that should fix that. And I can see we have Lucy and Simona back. Mm -hmm. We're back. Mm -hmm. I have questions. I have questions. Yay! I'll mute. <laughs> Uh, so my question was just, I think there's been so much helpful information about like why educators should share their work and how they can do it and what licenses they should use. Another way I could see educa educators being in a like, especially good position to help um, make things more open is that they can teach their students about why it's important to keep things open, about what uh, Creative Commons licenses are. And I just wondered if you guys had any resources or materials or even just advice for how teachers can bring this up in the classroom or in clubs or however they're teaching. 
Okay, I do, um, and it's called, uh, so we have a set of resources at School of Open, so pasting into the chat, and basically schoolofopen.org contains a lot of short courses and tutorials that um, you can go through on your own or with your students, um, and the one that I like to recommend people who are very new to CC licensing is Get Creative Commons Savvy or Get CC Savvy, and this online challenge takes about, and I'll paste the link into the chat here, it takes about 30 minutes, and it takes four steps and pretty much walks you through um, what Creative Commons licenses are, it has a video, it gives you some scenarios, like if you're a musician and you're in this scenario, what license would you choose? And if you're a teacher, um, what license would you choose? And kids can do it, um, and kids actually have a really um, good experience with it because it's very simple and basic, but it allows them to think creatively. So I'd really recommend going through those resources um, and integrating that into um, whatever classroom lesson you're teaching. I think any lesson that involves media, the creation of media or research, um, adding the Creative Commons um, education element to it um, is a great idea, especially if they're looking for resources online. You want to get students to give credit properly to the creators' works that they find. Great. Thank you for that. Um, we've actually had a question come through um, from um, a, a viewer, um, so from John Gray's, and he's also on Discourse. And so he raised a question around open source Android app competitions, and a lot of these now have massive cash prizes. So his question is around, very much around market failure of software developers and who have not created open source educational apps or who are creating educational apps but not making them both open source. So do you feel like these types of competitions are good incentives or are they kind of destroying the idea of open source? Um, so, um, so I, I caught about half, caught of, about your half of your question. Your <laughs> okay, I'll repeat it. I, I, I guess in, this, in essence John Graves is talking about the these different competitions that we're seeing across different countries for people who are creating app competitions with massive cash prizes, particularly in the educational sector. And so he feels that, it, like, well, he's wondering if it's a market failure of software developers who have not created open source educational apps. And he's asking, do you think these competitions are good incentives or are they killing what Creative Commons is trying to create? Um, that's, a good uh, question. that's a good question. One, one. Um, sorry, Sarah, uh, can, sorry I Sarah, can I ask you this? <laughs> kind of, um, <laughs> distracting to me. My echo. Um, so one actually good example of this that um, it does incorporate open source and a Creative Commons license requirement is the Global Learning X Prize. And I will actually post a um, link to that. But we all know what X Prize is, and the Global Learning X Prize is um, specifically focused on developing educational software that will, you know, bring more learning to the rest of the world and they actually we, we were talking to them and we got them to put a CC by license requirement on all content that comes from this competition and also all of the software that's developed from this competition is required to be open source. So I think uh, wh wh when there are competitions like these we should work with them um, as much as possible to get that licensing requirement in and that open source requirement in where those, where those competitions exist where there is no open source licensing requirement that's, that's unfortunate. Um, but you know, it's a free market. It, it could harm what CC is doing, but we, there's other competitions that do require open source, so I think that's that's a good thing. And, and I'm not a developer, so I'm not as familiar with all these competitions um, that he brings up, but um, I'm happy to answer additional questions, questions um, through email um, later. Email later. Okay. Um, we have one other question, and I think like I can ask it for you, and you can defer <laughs> mm -hmm. if you wish. And, and maybe we, you could, yeah, we could take this conversation to discourse. But he's asking, what open source and Creative Commons software and content should be usable from a licensed perspective in this context? Uh, so uh, I caught so the last I couple of questions. questions. Sorry. Um, I'm sorry about the internet connection. It doesn't seem to be our friend today. Um, what open source Creative Commons software and content would be usable from a licensed perspective in this context? And so, in essence, you kind of already answered that um, by saying that, yes, there is a Creative Commons licensing, in particular to this competition. Can you just tell us again what license that you guys asked them to put on this competition? Uh, creative uh, Commons. Creative Commons. 
Gotcha. So any educational so resource that, 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 that would be under CC by any by. software code would be under open source license open source software license. We we don't recommend Creative Commons licenses for software at all. There's a huge set of open source software licenses that are better for that. Our licenses are for content that is not software, like media. Great. Thanks for that. I hope um, we've answered John's questions, but he can get back to us on discourse. We can continue the conversation there as well, if he hasn't. Um, so. So I know there was a question in here around um, GitHub and the, or sorry, Creative Commons on GitHub. And um, so, how do you guys use this as a learning product? Oh, so actually, that's actually that's a very, a very development. Um, starting in February, uh, we decided um, as an organization. Um, that we would drastically alter how we run the organization. That was actually thanks to Mozilla. Um, we had a staff in town meeting in Toronto, and uh, I think it was Matt. Matt from Mozilla came and gave a lunch hour talk about working in the open and how they were using kind of their own version of like a GitHub issue tracker um, with their developers. And we thought, wouldn't it be great if we kind of worked that way? And so immediately when we got back at the end of February and March, we just threw everything up on GitHub. All of our strategic goals are there, all of our projects. Um, it's really drastically altered the way we run the organization. We're much flatter now. We all manage our own projects. And we're on. We're getting to like a two-week cycle where we check in every two weeks um, on progress of our projects. And so if you go to GitHub, um, let me GitHub Creative Commons slash Creative Commons, and I'll paste the link in here, you can see all the different projects that Creative Commons staff are working on, and the public is free to plug into them as they want to. They can create issues, ask questions. Um, we also have a public IRC channel now that we staff plug into every morning, no matter where they are in the world, um, and that's where we work in the open. And so I'd say that uh, putting everything online that's one another layer of open working that um, that's beyond copyright licensing of content that we are experimenting with, and so far it's working out really well for us. So it's adding an additional layer to working in the open. That's, that's yes, great. yes. Um, okay, so I think we will checking on our time. We can start with some wrap up questions. Um, so Lucy, did you have a wrap up question you wanted to ask? I do, and I'm going to fight the internet to try and ask it. So hopefully you guys can hear me. Um, I just want to know kind of as a wrap-up question, Jane, if there was someone who is like on the fence about whether they should share their materials openly, uh, what's the one thing you would say to them about why they should share in the open? I'd say, you know, what? what's the worst that can happen? <laughs> um, when you put something up online anyway, people are going to share it whether you want them to or not. That's kind of the nature of the digital universe. But also, I'd say just start small. You know, start with one thing that you're okay with sharing. Put on. I'd say just go for it with the most open license and see what happens. And usually, when people do that, they see that only good things happen from it, um, and then they continue to share more. Um, of course, if your primary goal is to make money off of something. Um, then you would only choose the licenses that reserve commercial rights, or you might not have need of CC licenses. But we're also working on that, too. We're exploring new business models that integrate CC licensing that might actually help um, uh, with your um, business model. Cool. That's really helpful. Thanks. Awesome, Jane. Um, another question is, can you tell everybody um, what they can do to actually contribute to Creative Commons? Um, well, you, we're a nonprofit, so you can support us by donating to us if you've ever used anything that's under Creative Commons or you know used our licenses to facilitate your own sharing. Um, we have an annual campaign at the end of the year. Um, that's when we'll probably do a big push to get donations, but you can donate anytime. Um, you can donate and get a free t-shirt. Um, um, you can also support us by going, plugging into our projects. So go to that GitHub page, see what we're doing, and help us out. Um, we're developing um, new products. This one product we're developing is called The List. It's an uh, Android phone application where you can submit photos under a Creative Commons attribution license. Basically, what we're going to be partnering with, with uh, organizations like the U.S. National Park Service, 
who will create a list of national monuments or parks that they want people to keep, take pictures of, and then if you're in that park, your phone will notify you, hey, the list needs you to take a photo of this, you know, Mount Rushmore, can you take a photo? And then you say, yes, you take a photo and you submit it, and it automatically goes through the Internet Archive under CC licenses, and that way anyone, journalists, um, activists around the world, or, you know, just bloggers can use that photo for free. Awesome. That is, that so, is cool. so cool. Yeah. That yeah. is awesome. It's like you're building a, like you're building a library of photos and a, a really great archive, especially around public spaces. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, the if, list, so, the list. oh, so go ahead. The list. The list. Perfect. The big shout out there, people. The call to action. <laughs> so, if people or educators, people who've just been listening in this call, be like, okay, they've, you've turned the tables. They're gonna change. They want to put some Creative Commons licensing on their work, and but they get a bit stuck, or they're a bit wary, or they're a bit unsure of what the next steps to take. Is there any way they can get in contact with you, or do you guys have like a wiki page of how-to that answers the audience questions, or the most frequently asked questions? Yeah, we do have an FAQ, although, to be honest, and don't tell my colleagues this, um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it, but um, I just pasted a link into the chat, wiki.creativecommons.org slash FAQ, just because it's turned into kind of an unwieldy set of comprehensive questions, every single possible question you could ask about Creative Commons, but it's not necessarily the most frequently asked questions because there's too many. So I'd say take a look at that page, but if it's too confusing, just shoot us an email at info at creativecommons.org. Um, that's the best way to reach us. Um, and um, you can take a look at our website, creativecommons.org. Um, and yeah, info at creativecommons.org if you have any questions. Amazing. Um, and if people want to keep up to date with all the projects, they need, it, is GitHub the best place for them to go have a look? I would say so, yes. That's where activity is happening. You can plug in. in. You can go to our website. Go to our website. We, our website is in drastic need of an overhaul. <laughs> so, um, there is good information on there, but some of the project listings may be outdated. So GitHub is really the best way to best best place to go if you're a little bit more tech savvy. If not, just go to our website. <laughs> and as a new user of GitHub, I can really recommend it. Don't be afraid of it. Jump in. <laughs> um, it is a little bit daunting when you first get in there, but I think once you find your groove, um, there's so much to learn. And like that, there's so many projects that are live on there, and you can really see how they're developing and how people are working. So it's a really incredible resource. Um, Jane, thanks so much for joining us. Um, we had this been a great, great conversation, um, and learned a lot more about Creative Commons. Um, and I'm looking forward to diving into all those links. Um, I'll be sure to put them up on the discourse page. Um, and so if anyone's got any more questions, they can add the questions to the discourse. And um, I know the links will be up there. And so hopefully we'll see some more visitors turning up on the GitHub page. Yay. 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 You're welcome. You're welcome anytime. <laughs> Thanks. And we'll be turning this into a podcast in the coming weeks. And you can find a link where to find that on the event page. But we'll also tweet it out later on. Um, Simone and Lucy, any final words? Or goodbyes. So interesting. So Thanks interesting. so much for joining us. Thank, okay. you, for Thank you for having me. It was such it a was pleasure. Pleasure. Oh, I'm done. Okay. Thanks. Bye, everyone. <laughs>